Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Law and Crime Network. I am Dan Abrams. We have got a big day with a lot of exciting courtroom action going on in three major cases around this country. But before we go there, a special welcome uh, to our new viewers from Philo. Uh, we're joining now 50 other premium channels on Philo, and we are thrilled to be there. And so we welcome all of our new viewers there to the Law and Crime Network, the ultimate destination for true crime stories. So stick around, because today is going to be just another busy day here at the Law and Crime Network. We've got three big stories. Uh, first, we've got the story of the murder case of Tara Grinstead. This has been the subject now of a major podcast, Ryan Duke on trial for her murder. But it's not a slam dunk case. And there were major, major hearings in that case yesterday on everything from whether they can use the word murder to change of venue to who is going to pay for a defense investigator, all sorts of incredibly important legal questions debated inside that courtroom yesterday. We're going to be covering that case. Also, live today, starting in a little bit, the trial of three police officers accused of assisting another officer in covering up the shooting of Laquan McDonald. Remember, this is the Chicago case where a young man was walking with a knife. And the question, of course, was why did a police officer Jason Van Dyke end up shooting him? Van Dyke uh, was convicted in that case. And now his three, what they're calling conspirators on trial, when I say conspirators, not in the murder itself, uh, but for official misconduct, obstruction of justice, basically accused of helping him cover up exactly what happened. Those three now on trial. That case begins today. And then finally, in Michigan, the former president of Michigan State University was arraigned. This is in connection with the Larry Nasser case. This is that doctor accused of molesting hundreds of young women, many of them gymnasts. Well, now the former president of that university is on trial for not being honest about what she knew and when she knew it. Uh, that arraignment uh, just occurred. So a lot of big legal stories in the news right now. But before we go into the courtroom, I want to show you a little bit about the true crime stories of the day. And here's Anthony Velez. Here are today's top crime stories trending on lawcrime.com and across the country. Authorities in Florida released surveillance footage of an argument between two passengers that escalated to gunshots being fired on a bus. The two men, 38-year-old Bendy Alcine and 24-year-old Michael Porter, can be seen arguing on a Broward County bus before a fist fight erupted between the two men. That's when Porter opened fire, hitting Alcine. Alcine was transported to a hospital where he's listed in stable condition, and Porter was eventually arrested. Investigators in Florida ruled the death of an infant found floating in the water off of the Florida coast a homicide. The baby, dubbed Baby June, was believed to be between four and seven days old when authorities found her body floating near the Boynton Beach Inlet in June. The medical examiner determined the child's death was a homicide, and authorities are now offering a $10,000 reward for information leading to an arrest. A woman in Oregon is under arrest after she was busted with a cache of weapons and a large quantity of methamphetamines. 22-year-old Catalina Tess was pulled over after officers in Aloha saw her leave a known drug house. Authorities reportedly found a handgun, a knife, and a throwing star in addition to the large amount of meth in the car. Tess and her three occupants were arrested and she now faces multiple charges including delivering meth and being a felon with a gun. Those were today's top crime stories. I'm Anthony Velez for Law and Crime. Yeah, not so helpful when they find all the additional stuff uh, as well in a, in a case like that. All right, we've got uh, a lot of stuff going on, as I said, a, a busy day in three different major cases around the country. Let's start, though, with the case of Tara Grinstead. This is a beauty queen who went missing in 2005. Someone she knew who'd uh, gone to the school where she was teaching, Ryan Duke, now about to go on trial for her murder. Here's a little background on that case. 
33-year-old Ryan Duke is charged with murder in connection with the disappearance of former beauty queen Tara Grinstead, who vanished from her home in 2005. Millions were drawn into the case after the wildly popular podcast Up and Vanished, and the case gained even more national attention with an Oxygen series. The Ryan you know, is that guy capable of murder? The Ryan Duke I know is not capable of murder, no. Police say Duke burglarized the local teacher's home and used his hands to kill her. Duke is charged with two counts of felony murder, one count of malice murder, aggravated assault, burglary, and concealing the death of another. Duke is charged alongside his former high school classmate, Bo Dukes, who is accused of helping to hide the body on his family's pecan orchard. The co-defendants are not related. Duke's new attorney claims her team decided to take on the case because they believe in Ryan's innocence. For Law and Crime, I'm Rachel Stockman. And there have been some major uh, fights over what kind of evidence will be presented in that case. We were live in those hearings throughout the day yesterday, and so some critical rulings still upcoming, uh, ranging from basically the, the defense at one point is saying it's not fair to give the prosecution two chances to make arguments, as is typical in a, in a case, because the prosecution has the burden of proof, so they get to make a closing argument, the defense goes, and then the prosecution usually gets a rebuttal. The defense here saying, no, no, they shouldn't be able to do that. They want funds uh, to hire a private investigator. They want a change of venue, which is probably the most likely thing for them to get, meaning they want the case moved because of all the attention in this small town in Georgia, only 9,000 people live there. Basically, they're saying everyone in town knows about this case. We can't get a fair trial here. I would expect that that will happen. Um, and then there's also a motion that basically they not use the word murder in the case. Again, that's probably one the defense will likely lose. Um, but we are going to continue to follow that. In the meantime, we want to show you the other big case that we are following uh, today. You may remember the case of the doctor, Larry Nasser, who molested all of those young gymnasts and, and those um, so eloquent women came in and testified against him, one after the other. Well, in, in light of that, there's the former president of Michigan State University, L Luana Simon, who has now been arraigned for being dishonest about what she knew and when she knew it. And so in that context, we want to take a little bit of a step back because this was an incredibly compelling case with compelling evidence and compelling testimony. And so with that arraignment ongoing, here's a look back at the Larry Nasser case and some of those survivors in their own words. case that not only captures the nation's attention, but leaves a lasting impact on the country itself. A case where victims unleash their fury against their attacker. I truly believe that you're the spawn of Satan. You intentionally and strategically placed yourself in positions of trust and power around girls. And you intentionally chose each and every time to assault us. Where emotions poured out. Goodbye, Larry. May God bless your dark, broken soul. Thought that maybe it was normal and acceptable for him to put his ungloved hands into and onto places throughout my body that may not have been okay. And where family and friends could not control themselves. You are a hog. A hog. Thank you very much for being for here. For the record, go to hell. Well, <laughs> Rarely is there a case like that of Larry Nassar. Larry Nassar was a former Michigan State University and USA Gymnastics team doctor who pled guilty in November 2017 to 10 counts of criminal sexual conduct in the first degree. 
He was accused of sexually abusing over 160 women, the majority of which were minors at the time of the offenses. His charges were split between two counties in Michigan, Ingham and Eaton, where the survivors of his abuse were permitted to provide victim impact statements directly to the court and Nassar. Law and Crime was one of the few media outlets that provided complete coverage and in-depth analysis of every statement. From beginning to end, each survivor came forward to deliver powerful and horrifying accounts of what they suffered at the hands of Nassar. Without my knowledge or consent, I had engaged in my first sexual experience by kindergarten. Jessica Tomashow recounted the disgusting moments during Nassar's treatment. He touched the most innocent places on my body that day. I remember fear and pain and asking myself, what is happening? While each story differed in detail and experience, the common theme was that Nassar was a man that manipulated underage girls under the guise of a doctor who could help their injuries, but he would ultimately abuse them for his own sexual gratification. Larry manipulated, violated every ethical code of being a doctor. Late summer of 2016 was when I began to understand that Larry had sexually abused me all those years. You were never a real doctor. You did not heal me. You only hurt me. Some survivors ultimately blame themselves for not initially recognizing this as sexual abuse. I feel really stupid for not understanding what was happening at the time, really guilty for not contributing in some way to stopping it sooner, and really, really emotionally vulnerable. I think for a while I thought something was wrong with me or that it was my fault. Although it was only a day or two before I spoke to the police after Rachel's interview, the guilt that I didn't say something years earlier will never go away. I was older. I should have trusted my gut. As the stories continued, we also learned that the abuse had a profound psychological and emotional impact upon many of the women. Every step of the way since leaving Michigan State University, such a beautiful campus, tarnished with your touch. I tried to hide from my pain, and that turned into addiction and crumbling relationships. I have anxiety and sleeping disorders all because of what you did to me. She took her own life because she couldn't deal with the pain anymore. But as we watched survivor after survivor, something happened. Women who at first chose either not to appear in court or even be publicly identified became emboldened by the words of prior survivors and began to come forward to provide their own statements. No longer was each woman an island. Rather, a community developed before our eyes. An army of women was created in those courtrooms that unleashed their fury against Nassar and the individuals and establishments that allowed him to thrive. To John Getter, since you are too much of a coward to be here in court today and this week, I hope you are watching or listening to me right now. You and Larry carry a lot of the same uh, characteristics. That's funny. You are a disgrace. You coached us, your athletes, who paid you thousands and thousands of dollars by fear, to control us and to purposely scare us. Well, John, you are now the one who has failed, not us. There has been no one to stand up to you until now. To USAG, who I don't think is here today, unfortunately, wish they were, but I'm just gonna be blunt and start by calling you out for paying athletes millions of dollars to stay quiet about Larry Nassar. And lastly, Michigan State University, shame on you. I went public about my story back in January of 2016, and let me tell you, I was terrified. I was terrified because of what you would do to me. Emma M. Miller, who was only 15 years old when she made her statement, went after MSU Gymnastics. So don't tell us that you never got that phone call from Clagus. Someone like Larissa Boyce doesn't make an assertion like she did against a doctor like you to your friend Clagus of sexual assault, and it just sits there. Prominent Olympic gold medalists also took to the courtroom to provide their statements. I thought that training for the Olympics would be the hardest thing that I would ever have to do. But in fact, the hardest thing I've ever had to do is process that I'm a victim of Larry Nassar. Larry, you do realize now that we, this group of women you so heartlessly abused over such a long period of time, are now a force and you are nothing. Finally, the last survivor to speak was actually the first woman to publicly accuse Nassar. Her name is Rachel Denhollander. His grooming and carefully calculated brazen sexual assault was the result of deliberate, premeditated, intentional, and methodological patterns of abuse 
patterns that were rehearsed long before I walked through Larry's exam room door. At 15, I believed that the adults at MSU surrounding Larry would do the right thing if they were aware of what Larry was doing, and I was terribly wrong. And discovering that I could not only trust my abuser, but I could not trust the people surrounding him has been devastating. It is part of the consequences of sexual assault, and it needs to be taken seriously. On January 24th, 2018, Ingham County Circuit Judge Rosemary Aquilina delivered a dramatic and scathing closing punch to Nassar, ending with her sentencing him to 40 to 175 years in prison. Would you like to withdraw your plea? No. Because you are guilty, aren't you? Are you guilty, sir? I just signed your death warrant. Two weeks later, Eaton County Circuit Judge Janice Cunningham didn't have any sympathy for him either. You will serve 40 to 125 years in the Michigan Department of Corrections. I believe this sentence is proportionate to the seriousness of the circumstances surrounding the offenses and of the offender. Now, before these state hearings, Nassar was already convicted and sentenced to 60 years in federal prison for child pornography charges. Suffice it to say, Larry Nassar will never step foot out of prison for the rest of his life. As the tale of Larry Nassar the man came to an end, though, it was only the beginning for others. Those parties that enabled the actions of a child sexual molester are now facing their own nightmares. Interestingly, these women initially spoke out to just put an end to their pain, to allow them to move on, to conclude an extremely dark chapter in their lives. Yet what they created was an army, an army of women that ignited a firestorm that the world will never soon forget. more of our high-profile trials and follow the day's top crime news at longcrime.com. You know, I've seen all of those women testify before, and I've seen Jesse's story before, and it doesn't stop having an impact. Every time I see it, it has that kind of impact, watching those brave women come into court and, uh, and tell their stories. <laughs> and now the president of, uh, the former president of Michigan State University, as we mentioned, has been arraigned. Uh, for lying to the authorities about whether she had actually been aware of complaints about Larry Nasser. So there's a lot of fallout from this case. It's an important case. Let's get in a break. When we come back, we're going to be talking about another important case, and that is the trial of three police officers accused of conspiring in the cover-up in the shooting of Laquan McDonald in Chicago. This is the Law and Crime Network. Coming right back. Welcome back to the Law and Crime Network. Many of you may remember the trial of Jason Van Dyke, the Chicago police officer who was eventually convicted of second degree murder and 16 counts of aggravated battery on October 5th for the shooting of Laquan McDonald. Remember, there was a dash cam video that showed him holding a knife, and there were initially allegations that he had come at the officers with the knife and that effectively they were protecting themselves. Well, that once the video was released, it seemed to tell a different story. And that led to Van Dyke's conviction. Now, three other officers on trial, Thomas Gaffney, David March, and Joseph Walsh, and they're charged with conspiracy, official misconduct, obstruction of justice. That trial starts today. In effect, they are being charged with helping to cover up his crime. And so this is going to be a big and important case uh, that starts very soon today, and we're going to be following it. Uh, we want to show you, though, some of the testimony that came up in the original trial, because that testimony could end up being relevant here in this new case. 
This is Officer Joseph uh, McElligott during the Van Dyke trial. All these details matter. Officer Gaffney is one of the people who's going to be on trial here. Um, I'm going to have to take a break in a sec, but I want to introduce my two guests because i got great guests here. Gene Rossi, uh, the law and crime trial analyst, former federal prosecutor, and Judge Ashley uh, Wilcott, um, also a trial attorney, join us uh, both. Thanks a lot to both of you for joining us. Judge Wilcott, let me start with you. Do you think we're going to see a lot of similar testimony to what we saw in the original Van Dyke trial? You know, it's going to be interesting, Dan. Good morning, first of all. So I do think we're going to see some of the similar testimony. Here's part of the difference is at least one of the witnesses' testimony was not recorded. The judge in that trial didn't allow it to be recorded. So what's hear. kind of exciting for the viewers is that this time we actually get to hear, hear it recorded, <clears throat> see it, and not just hear about what the testimony was. All right. Uh, Gene, I, I think maybe uh, you weren't able to hear that. but. Uh, but no, that's okay. Um, so look, why don't we do this? Uh, Gene, I'm going to come back to you in a moment. We're going to be covering sure. this story all day. Uh, we're going to be going live into that courtroom shortly in this trial of these three officers. Let's get in a break. This is the Law and Crime Network, and the Gaffney, March, and Walsh trial will begin soon. We'll go into that courtroom live. Back in a moment. Welcome back. We will be heading into a Chicago courtroom soon, live, to be covering day one of the trial of three police officers accused of effectively conspiring to cover up uh, the shooting of Laquan McDonald. In the meantime, we want to show you some of the testimony from the trial of Jason Van Dyke, the actual shooter in that case, who was convicted, because a lot of that is going to be relevant in this new case. And here's a critical piece. It relates to the dash cam video that became the central focus in this case. Here is the Van Dyke trial and how they synchronized the dash cam videos together to show exactly what happened. I know it's hard to watch, but it is critical in connection with this case, those to that dash cam video leading up to Laquan McDonald uh, being shot. Gene Rossi, former federal prosecutor, um, how important is the lead up, meaning the, the, the crime that these three are charged with now is essentially after the fact, the cover up. So how important is the video leading up to the shooting of Laquan McDonald in connection with their cases? It's the gestalt, Dan. Uh, when you're charging obstruction of justice or accessory after the fact, you have to show the event that motivated the three officers to make false statements and conceal. So the more uh, meat on the bones you put regarding the event, the video, the uh, eyewitness of uh, other officers, that explains why those three officers acted the way they did. It's very crucial. And also it's important because the, the claim was that, that he had actually gone after them with a knife right before the shooting that's one of the lies that's alleged is that he effectively came at them uh, with that knife. And the video then becomes critical in disproving that and kind of saying there's no way you could see that event and claim he came at them, right? Exactly. Your two videos synchronized uh, show that the, when those officers put together the, their reports, that, that they were engaging in pure categorical fiction. And their motive was to protect their friend, uh, Jason Van Dyke. The, the videos are just incredibly powerful. But, but I would say that in, in their defense, Ashley Wilcott, the argument would be <laughs> that at times when you're in a tra traumatic incident like that, as a law enforcement officer or anyone else, um, things can feel different and feel more threatening at times than they actually end up being when you look at the video. I completely agree, Dan, and it is chaotic, it's emotional, and you're reacting. However, one of the officers, the prosecution alleges, even says that Laquan attacked the Van Dyke. And in that video, you don't see any evidence of that. So when there's such a huge discrepancy between the officer's statements and what the video shows, I think that weakens that defense. But I think the, the question becomes, is there a difference between being wrong 
and intentionally lying, right? I mean, that, the defense, I assume here, is going to be, we were wrong, but we weren't trying to lie, right? That's right, because it does have to be intentional. That's one of the elements of the charges that they're facing in the conspiracy and the, and the covering up. And so, you know, the cover-up cops, it does have to be intentional. But it begs the question, even with the events as you've described, where it is dark, chaotic, lots going on, lots of police, emotional, all of those things, could they really have been wrong and said, oh, he was attacked and, oh, this happened, or was it an intentional cover-up? I think that the prosecution actually has some good facts to say it was intentional because of the details that the officers gave in their statements. Well, but I, we'll I, say I think that. one way to assess that is to look at other witnesses who were there to get their perception, and one of those witnesses did testify in the Jason Van Dyke trial, and that was Xavier Torres. Let's listen to a little bit of his testimony. So that was from the trial of Jason Van Dyke, who was convicted of second-degree murder and 16 counts of aggravated battery for each bullet uh, that was fired into Laquan McDonald. But now, this is the trial of the three officers who allegedly helped to cover it up. And Gene Rossi, what do you think is the best defense for them here? I think the best defense, and they pro probably could have called an expert on this, is that when you're a police officer and you are confronted with a situation like this, you have to, your, your mind doesn't move in just seconds, it moves in, in slices of a second, a thousand slices. And every movement of a defendant who is armed, and he did have an, a knife, that, that, that one one thousandth of a second has profound consequences. So you have to make instantaneous decisions. And, and I would have called an expert to say, police officers, when they're approached, when they're uh, confronted with incidences like this, a normal person who sees it in hindsight and say, that's how I would have acted. But a police officer doesn't have that luxury. And therefore, we should give them more you know, discretion and leniency because it is a dangerous job. And again, the trial that we are following today here on the Law and Crime Network is not the trial of Jason Van Dyke. He has already been convicted. This is now for the three other officers. You know, I don't know the answer to this question. I probably uh, should know the answer. But uh, Ashley Wilcott, do you know, would we expect that they might try to call Van Dyke? I would assume not in connection with this case. Well, you know what, I, I maybe, because he's already been convicted. He has nothing to lose by testifying. There are none of his rights um, that he necessarily is going to, to not want to, to waive and, and testify. I think, Dan, it depends on this, and that is his whether or not his actions were necessary based on the circumstances and the scenario. And his testimony, I think, would be, yeah, absolutely, I felt that my actions were necessary and appropriate, given he had a knife, et cetera, et cetera. That could help lead credibility, lend credibility to these three cops who have given these different versions to say it was a necessary action. And, and regardless of the video versus what we recall happened, he acted appropriately and we did nothing to cover up or conceal what happened. But I, I would think that uh, pending his appeal, he'd probably want to hold off on uh, oh, Dan. another. Okay, go ahead, Gene, real quick. Yep. Dan, I think I have the answer to your question. I have the memo that was filed by the prosecutors before yep. Judge Stevenson, and um, they put that they're expecting that Officer H, which is Van Dyke, is going to testify consistent with his prior testimony. So I think they intend to call Jason Van Dyke. Interesting. All right. Um, that'll be good. That'll be interesting testimony for certain. And that's part of the reason we're going to be covering this uh, live here on the Law and Crime Network, an important case. An interesting case. Let's get in a break. Uh, we will be back with more coverage of the trials of police officers Thomas Gaffney, David March, and Joseph Walsh in a moment. We are waiting for live testimony to begin in the trial of three police officers accused of conspiring to cover up the shooting of Laquan McDonald in Chicago. This is the high-profile case where there was that dash cam video of McDonald holding a knife, but at quite a distance from the officers. Jason Van Dyke, already convicted, second-degree murder 
in connection with that case. But now three of his former colleagues on trial for, they say, lying about exactly what happened at that scene. And one of the critical questions becomes use of force. We've already been talking about it. And that is, how much force is reasonable? And when is it reasonable? Well, both the prosecution and the defense called experts in this in the first trial, in the Van Dyke trial, and they offered different standards uh, by which Van Dyke should be judged, and I think that's going to be important in connection with this case, too. So let's take a look back at some of that testimony. In a police-involved shooting, this is everything. What is reasonable? What is a reasonable use of force? And so this is the expert coming from the prosecution side. In a minute, we'll hear from the expert from the defense side, because it's really interesting to hear how they differ in what they say the standard ought to be. But let's play a, a little bit more here of Yuri Patrick, the state's expert on use of force. This, again, was from the trial of Jason Van Dyke as we await the beginning of the trial of uh, three uh, police officers who had worked with him at the time. All right, so you listen to him, and it sounds pretty straightforward uh, with regard to what the standard is for the use of deadly force. And yet, uh, Judge Ashley Wilcott, we're going to play at the top of the next hour the defense's expert who will show you what a different kind of assessment is like. But how much do jurors rely on these experts when you've got one expert saying one thing and another expert saying something else? Well, here's my experience on the bench, Dan, and that is, first of all, most often you have experts on both sides. If one side's going to introduce an expert, so is the other. And I find that juries, after the fact, if they are willing to talk about the case, really, it hinges on the credibility of the experts often, not necessarily what the experts say is their opinion, since you have both sides presented. So often it's the credibility, demeanor, and believability of the expert that I think affects the jury. But it, it, it tends to be, Gene, that you get these people who all have very nice-sounding resumes <laughs> saying very different things. Well, I got to focus on what the judge just said, which was excellent. It's the credibility of that expert. And if the expert says something that is contrary to what the facts and the video and reports show, that, that expert is just completely discounted. In the trials I had involving battling experts, you know, we tried for the government when I was a federal prosecutor to get an expert that a jury's going to uh, lend a lot of credibility to. And the judge is right. It's not just what they say, it's how they come across their demeanor. But it has to match yeah. the facts of the case in the video. All right. Um, let's get in a break. We are waiting for the live coverage to begin in that case. In the meantime, we'll play that defense's expert after this break. This is the Law and Crime Network. Coming right back. Welcome back to the Law and Crime Network. We are waiting for live coverage to begin. Uh, we're waiting to go live into the courtroom of one police officer, two former police officers, now charged in conspiring to cover up the shooting of Laquan McDonald in Chicago. This was that very high profile case with that dash cam video of McDonald uh, with a knife in his hand, but seemingly posing no threat to the officer. Uh, Jason Van Dyke was found guilty of second-degree murder in connection with that case and 16 counts of aggravated battery. We have been listening to a state's expert who testified in the Van Dyke trial, who very well might testify in connection with this case, too, basically talking about when it would be appropriate uh, to use force. And before we get to what the defense uh, would say, and I think it's so interesting to compare how an expert for the prosecution lays out a different standard than an expert for the defense. But before we go there, uh, let's go to our top trending crimes of the day with Anthony Velez. And we are continuing to wait for live testimony to begin in day one of the trial of Thomas Gaffney, David March, Joseph Walsh, two former officers, uh, one current officer, accused of conspiring to cover up the shooting of Laquan McDonald. We had been listening before the break 
to the state, the prosecution's use of force expert. And that's critical because the standard is what would a reasonable officer do in a particular situation with regard to the use of force. But when you listen to the prosecution's expert and you compare it to the defense expert, it can get very interesting. So we've heard from the prosecution's expert. Now let's listen to some of what Barry Brood, who was the defense's expert on behalf of Jason Van Dyke, testified to in his trial. There it is. I mean, that is the key difference in the trial of Van Dyke. And in the end, the jury did not believe the defense's expert. But boy, that Gene Rossi is just so starkly different from what the prosecution's expert was saying as to what is a reasonable use of force. I got to tell you, it goes back to the facts, Dan. And that last answer, not sure. Uh, if I'm a prosecutor, my rebuttal or closing, I'm going to shove that down the defense's throat because their own expert is basically saying my guy should not have shot him. Not sure is not a good position to take if you're an expert for the defendant. But I got to say this. It goes back to the credibility of the prosecution's expert. He was very measured. He was very precise. And he gave a good analysis of what the two hurdles are. You got to know when to start and you have to know when to end. And in both situations, Van Dyke failed those tests. And you know, it's interesting, um, Judge Wilcott, that he's fo focusing on the first shot because, of course, there were uh, 16 or you know something shots fired <clears throat> into Laquan McDonald's body, and the first one is almost the easiest one to deal with. It's it's the ones after that that become even harder. Absolutely. And the fact there were that many, 16 shots is excessive, I think, in any circumstance, because generally no one's going to survive 16 shots. So that, I think, was a fact that the defense really couldn't argue against. And, and so the next question becomes, what was the cause of death? Meaning, if you're going to say that he was, you know, still fighting back or not, after the first shot or the second shot, the number of shots does become relevant because he was charged with all of these counts of aggravated battery. And um, so the medical examiners on this issue of when did he die, how did he die, becomes another issue where you have the prosecution versus the defense. Let's play the prosecution's expert, this is from the Jason Van Dyke trial, about what the state's position was on how and when Laquan McDonald died. So it sounds to me like what the prosecution's expert was saying is that he survived and each one of the 16 bullets contributed to his death. And it sounds like the defense is saying, in effect, he died almost immediately. But Gene Rossi, what is the, the difference legally between those two positions when defending a police officer in a use of force case like this one? Well, it's not a very appealing position. If someone is shot and they die, and then five minutes later you go up and you put another bullet into their body, um, you can't be charged with a murder or attempted murder. And we have 16 shots, and if the defense is saying that he probably died from the first two or three shots, then the other uh, 13 counts uh, should be acquittals as a matter of law, and you could have a motion for judgment of acquittal at the end of the government's case if you can persuade the judge. Um, I did want to add one thing. I, I got to correct what I said earlier. Um, I read the memo again, and uh, I don't think Van Dyke is going to testify at this trial. I, I misspoke and I apologize to your viewers. All right. So what, why don't you explain to us a little bit, because we had been talking earlier about whether Jason Van Dyke, uh, the police officer who was the subject of this previous trial, was going to testify in the case of the other three officers who were waiting for that trial to begin uh, very soon here live. Um, and we were wondering, is he going to be called? Is he going to be questioned, et cetera, in connection with the three who were accused in the cover-up? Gene, any more context as to why you've changed your position on that? 
Well, <laughs> the, the memo that was written by the prosecutors, the, uh, the co-conspirator memo, if you will, it, it proffers the evidence. And they mentioned uh, Van Dyke, but in their list of uh, witnesses who will testify to prove the conspiracy, they don't list Van Dyke. And here's probably why. He's, he's uh, just got convicted. He's going to be sentenced. He wants an appeal. Yeah. And, and unless a judge forces him to testify because he somehow waived his Fifth Amendment right, I doubt any lawyer uh, is going to allow his client to testify in this trial. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I was, I was surprised uh, to hear that. But thank you for that clarification. I apologize. Let, let's, get in a, uh, let's get in a break here. Uh, we are, as I say, waiting for the live trial to begin. In the case of Gaffney, March, and Walsh, we will be covering that trial live here on the Law and Crime Network. Uh, but until that happens, we're going to continue to review some of what happened in the Jason Van Dyke trial, the trial of the actual officer involved in the shooting of Laquan McDonald, because a lot of that testimony is going to be similar. This is the Law and Crime Network, and we're coming right back. Welcome back. We are waiting to begin live coverage in the trial of three police officers accused of conspiring to cover up uh, the shooting of Laquan McDonald in Chicago. The officer who actually fired uh, the 16 bullets, uh, Jason Van Dyke, has already been convicted. So this is basically phase two of that case. And as we await live coverage, we want to show you some more of what happened in the Van Dyke trial because it does relate to what's going to be happening in this case as well. One of the arguments from the defense, of course, was that what was going on in his mind when he fired the weapon was fear, that he feared the fact that Laquan McDonald had a knife and he was in reasonable fear uh, for his safety and as a result, uh, that is why they say he fired those 16 bullets. So one of the people the defense called was a psychologist by the name of Dr. Lawrence Miller to try to explain what happened and how it made the defendant, at that time, Jason Van Dyke, feel. You know, Judge Ashley Wilcott, it seems to me that what the defense was doing was combining relevant testimony with sympathy. Right. The relevant testimony being about sort of what goes on in someone's head as something like this is happening. The sympathy is you got to understand how hard this is and, and which all absolutely is is probably true. I would agree it's true, but I would almost question the relevance, the part that you bring out of the sympathy. And when he, the psychologist, was just testifying about the short-term effects of the stress and what can happen to a person and all the effects that they can have as a result of a shooting, it's almost like what is the relevance of that when we're really looking again at what was the officer's state of mind at the time he shot? That's the bottom line question. Let's listen to a little bit more of Dr. Lawrence Miller from the trial of Jason Van Dyke in the shooting of Laquan McDonald. My opinion is that on 10 2014, Officer Jason Van Dyke responded to what he perceived was a deadly threat and responded in a way that, based on his training, was designed to neutralize that threat as he understood it. And would your opinion uh, be that his response was based upon a reasonable officer's response in the same situation? Uh, a reasonable officer faced with the perceptual reality of what that officer, of, of what Officer Van Dyke was experiencing, the answer would be yes. Okay. Thank you, Doctor. I have no further Thank questions. So, Gene Rossi, how important is a witness like that? I agree with the judge. If I'm a juror, I'm going to be just shaking my head. Okay, we get it. Officers are under a lot of stress. But what does this have to do with what happened uh, in that video and, and the reports that are going to be filed and all this? I, I, I'll, probably 85% of what he said was irrelevant, period. Well, and it would be relevant in connection with sentencing, right? I mean, when you're talking about what kind of sentence someone should get, it's a different yes. standard than in the actual guilt or innocence phase. And also, Dan, at a sentencing, 
I always say the uh, floodgates are open. You can bring out his family, the stress and pain uh, and obsessive rumination that he's going to live with for the rest of his life. All that goes into sentencing, but this is a trial on the elements of a crime. Totally different. Right, and because I think we'd all agree <clears throat> that this probably was an in incredibly, you know, horrible moment for him um, in retrospect, right? That as he looks back on it and thinks about it, and no officer, and I can tell you I know this, no police officer wants to fire their weapon. Um, that is a, that's almost a given. The question in this case as to guilt or innocence relates to was it reasonable uh, in that context? And now, how does that relate to the question of the three who are now charged in the cover-up? I guess their questions are going to be somewhat similar in evaluating how much of a threat was he and consequently why did they put it down in their reports the way that they did? Right. I, I, I'm trying to find some relevancy. Here's what I would argue if I was a defense attorney. The state of mind of these officers who witnessed it, and even uh, Officer Van Dyke, because of what this psychologist just testified to, when you commit an egregious act, even if you think it's justified, or you witness something like this, for the next 24 hours, 36 hours, your mind is just mush. It's almost like um, being told a close family member has been, has been killed suddenly. For the next two or three days, you are in a fog, mm -hmm. and you could argue that's relevant to uh, argue diminished capacity so that their false statements, their inaccurate reports, maybe they weren't so egregious. Yep. All right, so we are waiting for <laughs> live coverage to begin, for the courtroom proceeding to begin in the trial of three people, one of them uh, still an officer, two of them uh, no longer police officers, who are charged with the cover-up of the shooting of Laquan McDonald. In essence, the allegation is they tried to cover uh, for <clears throat> Jason Van Dyke. Um, this is an important trial. It's conspiracy, official misconduct, obstruction of justice. And we're going to be live in that courtroom for day one, keeping an eye to make sure that uh, uh, see what's happening and when it's going to happen. Let's take a break. The Law and Crime Network will come back in a moment. As we await the beginning of the trial of three uh, former police officers who are charged in the cover-up of the shooting of w Laquan McDonald, we are looking back at the case of the original defendant, Jason Van Dyke who was charged with murder. And we've been talking a lot about things that were important in the testimony, the standard of what it would be reasonable, not reasonable, but there's nothing more important than the, the testimony of the defendant himself. Jason Van Dyke testified in his trial. We do not expect, as Gene Rousey was pointing out, that he will testify in the trial of his three former colleagues. But his testimony in this case was the make or break time. That's the point where the jury either says, we believe you, we don't believe you, we are willing to look beyond the videotape uh, to say that there was maybe something going on that, that maybe we couldn't see. And so we want to play a little bit of the testimony of Jason Van Dyke from his trial where he was charged with murder. This is it. I mean, this testimony is the trial, apart from the dash cam footage, it's the trial of Van Dyke. Yes, you got the experts, you got the medical experts, you got the use of force experts, you got the witnesses. This is the guy. Now we're waiting for the trial to begin. Three of his former colleagues who are now charged with covering up the shooting of Laquan McDonald. But I think it's really important to watch some more of Van Dyke's testimony before I go back to my guest because it's so critical how he describes what he saw and what he did. Well, that's, that's not the best argument for uh, use of force there. Uh, Judge Wilcott, I think that he was a pretty good witness that, in terms of what we've seen, but that last point, it's just so hard to explain why you keep shooting, right? I mean, you can get away with the answer on the first couple of shots, the fear, the this, 
But then when the answer is, well, why did you then fire shots 13, 14, 15, and 16? And the answer is, because I wanted him to stay on the ground because it would be easier to get him into custody. Gets a little tricky. Yeah, he went one answer too far. So he describes how he felt, the eyes bugging out, expressionless, didn't drop the knife. As soon as he realized he dropped to the ground, he stopped shooting. All of that sounds very credible. But, Dan, I think he did go one answer too far. And then when he says, well, it'd be easier to get him into custody, there goes the credibility for me right out the window. But, Gene Rossi, I don't know what else the answer is, right? How else do you explain shots 13 to 16? What I would have, well... His best argument is this. He has all this background that, that uh, the victim was on a rampage. He had a knife. He was slitting tires. He was high on PCP. He was threatening people. And from 10 feet away, it may not seem a, a, a short distance to some people, but a person with a knife high on PCP can charge you at any moment. And, and what he probably could have said is that even though I shot him, and he fell to the ground, I didn't know whether he was still able to get up and attack me or charge me, and therefore I had to use additional force. That's all you can say. But I agree with the judge and both of you that that, that extra answer um, was, you know, borderline gratuitous. Yeah, yeah. All right, we are waiting for live coverage to begin for three of his uh, former colleagues charged with covering up. Uh, what actually happened by misstating uh, things on reports, obstruction of justice, conspiracy, official misconduct. That trial, day one, is today. The Law and, Law and Crime Network, we will be covering that live. In the meantime, let's get in a break, and we come right back. We are waiting for live coverage to begin in the trial of three police officers accused of conspiring to cover up the shooting of Laquan McDonald. As we wait for that, we are looking back at the case of the person who actually shot Laquan McDonald. He admitted that he shot him. Uh, also, there was a videotape of it from the dash cam. Jason Van Dyke, who was convicted back in October of second degree murder, 16 counts of aggravated battery. The jury there deliberated for about a day before coming back with that conviction. And so that case is going to be relevant as we begin day one of this trial of the three other officers accused in the cover-up. And what more important testimony than the testimony of the defendant himself, Jason Van Dyke. So let's go back into that courtroom from a couple of months ago when Jason Van Dyke was testifying in his own defense about what he saw and how he felt and why he felt he needed to use that force. The repeat of that was actually what had been coming from the courtroom. If you're wondering why we kept showing that again and again, that was the feed uh, from the courtroom. And so the question now, Judge Ashley Wilcott, is will that testimony be introduced in any way in the trial of the three officers who are now going to face trial for the cover-up? No, Dan, I don't think that it can be introduced in lieu of the defendant's testimony when, or meaning Van Dyke, when it can be used as if a person who had previously testified is now unavailable. He's in jail. He's clearly available. I do not believe that it can be used instead of him having to actually testify. Gene, I've only got 10 seconds here. You agree? I, I, I got, uh, with the utmost respect, under Federal Rule of Evidence 804, the only way that could come in is if he's unavailable, obviously, and the party had an opportunity to cross-examine on the same issues. That didn't occur here. Yep. The three defendants did not have a chance. It's Crawford. You need a chance to cross-examine. Yep. All right, fair enough. Uh, Gene Rossi and uh, Judge Ashley Wilcott, thank you so much for joining us on the Law and Crime Network. We appreciate it. We are going to go to break here. I'm going to sign off. Vincent Hill will be here in the chair. Live coverage expected to begin shortly in the trial of those three officers accused of a cover-up in connection with that shooting. So stay tuned, and we will see you in a couple minutes. Be right back.